Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to, st to join us. We are doing a new series of lessons. This is lesson number three in that new series entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Hmm, Deuteronomy was written a long time ago. Could that be present truth? Well, let's see what we can find. This is lesson number three in that series for October 16 of 2021 entitled The Everlasting Covenant. Present truth, everlasting? That sounds like almost a contradiction, doesn't it? Well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the promises that you've given us, the covenants, the promises, the, the things that are available through faith in your, you and your kingdom. May we come to be more like you as we study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To those who have carefully studied all of Scripture, it becomes apparent that there is a very close link between the first chapters of Genesis and the book of Revelation. Now you said, hold on this bit. We're studying Deuteronomy, and why are we talking about Genesis and Revelation? Well, let's see if we can figure that out. This lesson will discuss, you, discuss the issues involved in covenant, as in a promise or an agreement. And one of the famous passages that talks about that is Revelation 14, verse 6. Jim? Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. From American Bible Society. Okay. Titus 1, 2, which is based on the hope for eternal life, God, who does not lie, promises, excuse me, promised us this life before the beginning of time. Good news, Bible. Okay, we're talking about eternal, everlasting, before the beginning of time. That goes back a long ways, right? There are actually a number of references to an everlasting covenant in Scripture. This week we will discover that the idea of covenant, talking about our faith relationship with God, is prominent in the book of Deuteronomy. Gary? Hence, it is no wonder that the Bible talks at other times about the, in quotes, everlasting covenant, Genesis 17, 7, Isaiah 24, 5, Ezekiel 16, 60, Hebrews 1320. Because the essence of the gospel is covenant, and the essence of the covenant is the gospel. God, out of his saving grace and love, offers you a salvation that you do not deserve and cannot possibly earn. And you, in response, love him back with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that's from Mark 12, 30, New King James Version. A love that is made manifest by obedience to his law. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3, New King James Version. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath afternoon, October 9. <clears throat> so now, questions. What does it mean to say the essence of the gospel is covenant and the essence of the covenant is the gospel? What do you suppose that means? The core. The core? core what's, what core are we talking about? <clears throat> the essence. The essence of the gospel is the core. Mm hmm so are we talking about faith here? We we're talking about a promise of God. We're talking about our promise to God. What would you say is going on there? It's God's promise to us. Yeah, yeah that should be pretty clear from um, Jeremiah 31, 34, I believe it is there. It seems um, that we just studied a few quarters ago, a whole quarter on the covenant. Didn't yes. We? Yep. So would you consider the promise of God made to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15 to qualify as a covenant? You know that famous verse? Yes. Just look at it for a second. And I will put in with I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring, this would be the covenant part or the potentially covenant part, her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Hmm, talk, speaking to the devil, right? <clears throat> so is that a covenant? Yep. 
that is perhaps the most one of the most important covenants in the entire scriptures. Okay, let me let me dig in a little deeper. Would it be correct to call the covenant relationship that we can have with God faith? Yes. Well, is that why Paul wrote what he did in first in Acts 16, 30 and 31? Then he, the Philippian jailer, led them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Good news, Bible. Now, that's good news, right? You and your family will be saved. Isn't that the gospel? Sound like the gospel? So if faith is the key to that, belief, faith is the key to that, then faith must be core, Carrie, to the gospel, right? Yeah. How does my faith, how does my belief save my family? Well, okay. That's does a good it, or is it that I then will help my family to understand and then they well, will... If you read the whole story, he took them, he took the apostles to his house, cleaned up their wounds, and then they, that night, they preached the, the, the truth to the whole family. So... Paul and Silas. Yeah, Paul and Silas. So I, I guess that's, that's what they're talking about. Well, the first obvious covenant in Scripture is recorded in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Gordon? The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you I will bless all the nations. Hmm. It, it doesn't say there that his descendants were going to become many nations. It no. says a great nation. Mm -hmm. But they were, in fact, did in fact become many nations, didn't they? Yeah. All his different sons. Well, because he tried to help the Lord, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord needs lots of help. That's right. The Lord <laughs> needs, needs lots well, of help. Well, would it be true that through you I will bless all the nations? Should have been. Yeah. Well, I think it still is. I mean, it's through them that we have the God, we have the scriptures, isn't it? Yeah, and now we are part of the spiritual Israel, which is again all nations. Yep. So. Well, we're going to read more about that in a moment. Genesis 15 verses 5 through 21. I'm not going to take time to read that whole passage. is a very interesting one, talking about how that covenant was sealed. Do you remember how that happened? Yeah, kind of, go ahead. <laughs> pretty gory. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. gory, and then... <laughs> he took three large animals, a cow, a goat, and a ram. He cut them in half. I don't know whether he cut them in half... Sideways. Sideways, or cut them in half lengthwise, and he laid them out side by side, and then he killed a dove and a pigeon and laid them out, and then he passed through, I guess, and then there was this, this black smoky thing came through, and it passed through, and wow. I'm glad we don't have to do that today. Yes. Then he fell asleep, kind of. And yeah, and there was a crazy dream. Yes. So did but Abraham he, actually do that, or was that his dream or his vision? Well, apparently he actually did that, and then he had the dream. That's what it seems to suggest. Abraham was promised that his descendants would rule from Egypt to the Euphrates. And did that happen? Well, Romans 4, 1 to 5 tells us this, and this, of course, would be Paul talking about, back about what happened in the Old Testament. What shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. I think it's King James I like. It says, and it was counted yeah. as righteousness. Yeah, exactly. Those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. But those who depend on faith, not on deeds, and who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right 
with himself from my Good News Bible. Now, I want to make a point here that um, maybe we should make a little more often. There are two steps in the process of our believing and, and, and following God's will. If he's, uh, two big steps. If he presents something to us, the first step is we have to read it or, or, or hear it, and we have to understand it. That will be the first step. And then the step, second step, we have to say, okay, do I accept it? Well, I should re believe it, understand and accept it should be number one. And then number two would be, okay, am I will can I and am I willing to implement it in my life? So there's the inward part and then there's the outward part going out. And when the Bible talks about faith and it talks about accepting God's will for our lives, it's really talking about that first part. And one of the reasons why I say that, think about the thief on the cross. What did he do to earn his salvation? Now we've told it, and you can't earn your salvation anyway, but Jesus said, what, I will, you, you will be with me in the kingdom. Yeah. And there he is, hanging, nailed to the cross. There's nothing, there's nothing he can do. He believed. He believed. Yeah. yeah, and that's the first part. So what are these verses that we just read trying to tell us? It should be obvious that we can never earn our way to heaven. I hope that's perfectly obvious. So heaven, in one sense, must be a gift. I heard a funny story one time. This is, of course, apocryphal, but uh, someone, a gentleman who was quite wealthy, decided he wanted to make sure we'd get to heaven. And he went to the pastor, and the pastor says, well, I heard a rumor that you, if you take a lot of money with you to heaven, you'll be able to get in. So he started collecting dollars, and then he realized, maybe they don't accept dollars in heaven. So he, I know I'll collect gold bars. So he stored all his money, he bought these gold bars, and he put them in a suitcase that was so heavy he couldn't even move it. And then, of course, he died, and of course, according to the, 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 the legend, he shows up before Peter's gate there in heaven, and Peter says, oh, welcome, what do you got in that suitcase? And he's so proud, he opens it up, and there's all these gold bars, and Peter looks at it and he says, why did you want to bring all that asphalt to, to heaven, or pavement to heaven? Because <laughs> the streets up there are paved with what? Gold. Gold, yeah. Okay, well, sounds a little bit like this situation. Why do you think Abraham trusted God? Remember that he had no Bible, no pastor, no Sabbath school, no church to attend. He only had a special relationship with God through various experiences, some of which are recorded in Scripture. So what makes him special? Well, he did have a close personal relationship with God. He talked face to face with God mm -hmm. at least a few times. Yeah. Well, Abraham was certainly a friend of God. Look what he did. Uh, Jim? Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Consider the experience of Abra Abraham. As the scripture says, he believed God and because of his faith accepted him as right. God accepted him as righteous. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scriptures predicted that God would put these Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Through you, God will bless the whole human race. Abraham believed and was blessed. So all who believe are blessed as he was. Good news okay. Bible. God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him, now these are words from Ellen White. God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. In the old days when I read household, I assumed, okay, that was probably Isaac and Ishmael, right? Well, and that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families and not a few but newly converted from heathenism. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. 
No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. Now, Abraham's running a university. Genesis 18, 19. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were won. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, Genesis 18, 19. And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Whenever he pitched his tent, where, wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, he's moved on, the altar remained in many a roving Canaanite, many roving Canaanites whose knowledge of God had been gained from the life of Abraham, his servant, tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. That's Ellen White, the book Education, page 187. Very interesting. He was running a university. Clearly. Sacrifices aren't what God wants, though. Yeah. Does he? He wants our loving service, our loving uh, commitment. So, and he, he, Inform, informed. Inform, persuaded yeah. information. I heard of a fellow years ago, he's, or not too long ago, actually. I don't want to convince people, I want to persuade them. I want to ultimately come to the conclusion on their own. Mm -hmm. And that's really what God, using logic, mm -hmm. not emotion, to mm -hmm. win you over. Well, yeah. We have to also consider uh, what kind of people that were living in that yeah. place. He was the only one who stood out. And they're all pagans. They were all pagans. They were sacrificing their old children. Yep. He says, no, it's going to be animals and clean animals. So, you know, and, and yes, he ran a university. There were so many families that who, who worked for him. So, yes, they had to be influenced by this godly man. Yeah. Well, Gordon brings up a good point. He didn't want dead animals, but then he asked Abraham to cut those animals in half and spread them out to did form God a... Did ask him to do that, or is that what he did? Well... I mean, that's Sometimes a good question. We, some, we're not just told. We don't know that for sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem because we, uh, what could be, appear to be more pagan than that? Yeah. And, and he brought his baggage with him uh, of ideas, and uh, it was a growth process on his part, was it not? Yeah. So those, that c ceremony of cutting the animals in half was part of the tradition of that region. Of that, that was the way you did it. At yeah. that time, to yep. make a covenant, make mm -hmm. a promise. Yeah. Sign a contract. Well, so, and I would say to answer your earlier question, I'm sure that as Abraham was sacrificing at his altar, remember this is a university. He's teaching everybody. He's instructing. He said, this is why we do this. This is the kind of, and basically he's, te he's teaching them to worship a very different kind of God, a very different kind of God. And, that, and yet when they come back, they offer sacrifices. Yeah. And that God is constantly seeking for ways to draw near to his people. And, you know, that's not so crazy. I'm sure you all have had the experience. I certainly have had the experience many times. Someone will say sometime, well, do you remember this con something that happened in the con And it's gone completely. But then all of a sudden, if I get in that situation, oh yeah, now remember. So it's the context that helps your memory to, to, to come alive again. So, well, a challenging question which we must deal with repeatedly as we study the Bible is, why did God choose the children of Israel as his special representatives on earth? Okay, you all know the answer to that, right? Well, De Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 in the... In the um RSV, the ESV, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, says they were talking about when um, at, with uh, Noah and they divided the nations. Mm -hmm. The translation in those two uh, translations, or three translations I mentioned, it when God divided the, the nations or portioned it out, He did it according to the sons of God, which would be the Elohim. But Israel was God's or Abraham, the descendant of Abraham, Jacob, was his special portion. And through that, he was supposed to educate the whole world mm -hmm. through, through so, the children of Israel. Let, let's make a couple of points. Jim has made one. Let me make another one. 
It certainly was not because they were all saints. And why did he give them permission to go in and occupy the land to drive out or destroy the nations that were there? Well, God repeatedly told the children of Israel that he honored them because of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was Abraham to whom God gave that original promise to which the children of Israel looked back. Do we have someone to look back to as a leader of Christianity? Would we dare to claim Christ as a leader of Christianity? I certainly hope so. That's why we call it Christianity, right? Well, he was a leader through the children of Israel. Yeah. All, all through the Old Testament is, he, yeah. is, is uh, Yeshua speaking to, uh, to his uh, creatures. Well, and, and it would be Mashiach in Hebrew or Christ in Greek. Do we as Gentile Christians have the privilege of claiming Abraham as our father? Carrie? Reading from Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendant of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so that's a very interesting statement to be made by the ultimate Pharisee. This was the band, remember, he started out saying, okay, if you don't believe exactly what we Jews think you should believe, you're, you're dead, you know? And here he is saying, <laughs> anybody who has faith is a child of God, a child of Abraham, right? What was the difference between Saul and Paul? Yeah. I mean, the knowledge was all there. Yeah. But suddenly he realized who this Christ Jesus was, and mm -hmm. the whole thing changed. That's what we call a fruit basket upset. A paradigm shift. A paradigm shift. He probably had memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. So he didn't have to carry scrolls around with him. Well, God had told Abram way back 400 years before the Exodus that they would be taken out of the land, out of that land, and would be given the land of Canaan as their property. But to make sure that they understood clearly how directly he planned to work with them, they went through that incredible experience of witnessing the 10 plagues on Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then that experience at Mount Sinai, while they were at Mount Sinai, that covenant, covenant that God wanted to have with them was renewed. The Sinai experience is remembered, by the way, I just will mention that I'm looking at some of the more remote and less well-known manuscripts from Ellen White, and she says, Adam and Eve were given the Ten Commandments. Very interesting. Well, didn't we have this last Sabbath that you made a beautiful statement that had they followed the Lord's yep. will, there would be no need for the. Yep. I will write them in your hearts. Yep. So that was the very intent from the very beginning. Yeah. Could you say, instead of you writing something in your heart, could you say, your mind will be, you will be educated mm -hmm. and ra la rationally, logically, you will come to a conclusion. Yeah. And be changed. And be changed. Well, it, it, <laughs> willing to listen. That's, it fits with, that, with all we're We listening. know that the Sinai experience is, is, is remembered primarily for the giving of the Ten Commandments. That's what people think of. You say Ten Sinai, they say, oh, Ten Commandments. If we are not Jews, does God expect that law to apply to us even in our day? Yes. If so, shouldn't God expect us to fill our side of the covenant? He's giving his side of the covenant. What about our side of the covenant? Could you find any reason why any of God's laws should be discarded? Can you think of any of them that, you know, we'll set up a new government here and we don't need the fifth commandment, the third commandment, well, the ninth is, commandment? There's only one they discard. <laughs> but well, in this case, uh, most, if not all, of our Protestant friends are all divided. They'll say, yes, it's okay, the law is there, but then one we don't need. Others will say, no, the law has been nailed to the cross. And these are very well-meaning Christians, mm -hmm. yeah. loving, well-meaning, meaning Christians. So, yeah. Well, the Hebrew word for covenant, berit, 
is found 27 times in the book of Deuteronomy, and so Deuteronomy has been called the book of the covenant. Those four sermons that Moses prepared, remember we talked about the four sermons that make up Deuteronomy, prepared, wrote, and presented the people repeatedly emphasized the relationship that God wanted to have with them, which is known as his covenant. And God started out by repeating the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. He said, okay, your parents heard this and really it impacted them enormously at the foot of Mount Sinai. But you're the younger generation. Maybe you're only five years old. Maybe you weren't even born yet when that happened. So let me repeat so there won't be any question at all about what I meant by those giving you those commandments and exactly all who was involved. But one of the most puzzling parts of this second giving of the Ten Commandments is the difference in reasons given for observing the Sabbath. Now surely Moses recognized that difference in the Sabbath commandment. We usually feel that the Exodus 20 version of the Ten Commandments is the more authentic one, of course, right? Why would Moses then say in Deuteronomy 5, verse 22, after giving the second version, which is a little different, he gave these commandments and no others? And Moses even had close to 40 years to mull it over, contemplate yeah. it, preach on it, yeah. and he came up with the Deuteronomy 5 version. Yep. Yeah. Having left, well, he did or God did? That would be the question. They both did. Having left Egypt, do you think the children of Israel focused on the fact that God had promised Abram that they would have the land of Canaan as their home? I mean, if you start out following this huge crowd and Moses up there, what, did any of them say, well, where are we going? <laughs> what are we going to? Uh, did, they, did they all understand the promise that had been made to Abraham? We don't know. How many knew of that promise? Well, we started this lesson by suggesting that God's covenant plans for the human family were established before the foundation of the earth. So, before the foundation of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge Christ had fulfilled. When upon the cross he cried out, It is finished! He addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. Now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. John 19.30 And 17.24 and that, of course, all is from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 834, paragraph 2. So, what have we just learned there? The cross experience was the fulfillment of an agreement between the Father and the Son that was established before the, sing the first human was created. Okay? So this was a plan. Obviously, what does that teach us? important things. God knew about the whole sinful process, everything that was going to happen before a single person was created. He knew when he made Adam and Eve. He knew when he created Lucifer that this was coming. Got a side question. Yes. Um, why? I, all the my Protestant friends I talk with, um, say so once you're saved, that as if the power of will um, is gone. You cannot be unsaved anymore. Mm. Right. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, across the board, everyone. Predestination. Very educated people. I'm going to be walking with one of them tomorrow. It's that, not, you cannot be unsaved. You cannot. Yeah. You lose your part of and they use that. Well, what's the purpose of going out and trying to uh, uh, win souls, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, it's already made... Uh, 
predetermined. Well, you're you're talking about a little, something a little different than what Charles well, is talking about. Well, you're talking about predestination, but he's talking about once saved, always saved. Well, but it's well, made that decision. You can't. Yeah. Uh, you're still no longer free. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the Calvinism, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. That's a, neither one of them are uh, biblical. Free. It's not yeah. biblical. That's a good. That's a good way to say it. Sum it up. We have seen that the Bible suggests, and Ellen White explicitly says that God's covenant with the human race was made before this earth was created. What does that imply? God made plans for our rescue and our salvation even before we were created or sinned. And even before Adam was created. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I said we, I'm talking about a whole, whole human race. Could we as a Seventh-day Adventist church accomplish what the Jews failed to do in their day? We've already seen that Genesis 6:18, 9:13, 15, 18 to 19 tell us that God had tried to establish a working relationship with many before the days of the Israelites. Genesis 17:7, 7, let me just read that, talks about an everlasting covenant. Since we mentioned that earlier, I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. And that sounds like something we read in Revelation 12, well, doesn't it? I'm sorry, Revelation 14. Okay. Just yeah. as I comment again, mm -hmm. uh, whatever the covenant has been given, even when the Lord says, a new covenant I give you, this is really truly, uh, you see consistency all along. It's the same covenant that the Lord, I'm going to be your, people, your God and you're mm -hmm. going to be my people. All yep. along, all over. And this is I'm going to write in your heart. It is clear from the five books of Moses that God was constantly trying to prevent his people from adopting the pagan practices of the nations around them. Okay, so how much do we know about those pagan practices? Not a great deal. Clearly they were pagan, polytheistic, meaning they worship many different gods, and involved some very degrading practices. They believe that when you need to really impress that you're God, you might even need to burn to death one of your children as a sacrifice. Can you imagine that? And in some other ways, it's even worse. In Deuteronomy, and we'll get to that a little bit later, in Deuteronomy 20, which we will study in the future, it is suggested that the children of Israel were to enter the land of Canaan, killing utterly everyone. Now, Gordon, I was waiting for you to say that can't be God's ideal, right? It wasn't, and we're going to read about it. Okay, <laughs> but you remember God's original instructions to, uh, to them about how they were to conquer the land? Okay, Gordon. Reading from Exodus 23, verses 20 through 33. I will send an angel ahead of you to protect you as you travel and to bring you to the place which I have repaired. So this is God's original. This plan is God, to, Exodus, 23, to Exodus 23. Exodus 23 is just Palestine. a couple chapters after yeah. the Sinai. In fact, it's still right there, really. Pay attention to him, that is the angel, and obey him. Do not rebel against him, for I have sent him, and he will not pardon such rebellion. But if you obey him and do everything I command, I will fight against all your enemies. Wait, wait who's going to do the fighting? God. God God's going to do it. Shall we say Jesus? Yes. Christ, Jesus Christ, because he was the God of the Old Testament. Yes. My angel will go ahead of you and, and take you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will destroy them. Now, it doesn't say how he's going to do that. See, did he just destroy them as nations? Did he scatter them, which would destroy them as nations, or did he literally kill them? Did he and send it, viruses I in? Think it, no, it comes afterwards as we read on. Yeah. The answer is there. Well. Was, she was going to drive them out. But yeah. Do not, bow, continuing ver, with verse 24, do not bow down to their gods or worship them, and do not adopt their religious practices. Destroy their gods and break down their sacred stone pillars. If you worship me, the Lord your God, I will bless you with food and water and take away all your illnesses. 
In your land, no woman will have a miscarriage or be without children. I will give you long lives and presumably healthy lives. Yes. I will make the people who oppose you afraid of me. I will bring confusion among the people against whom you fight, and I will make all your enemies turn and run from you. Okay, so that's what's going to happen, what should have happened to those nations, right? Turn and run. Verse 28, I will throw your enemies into a panic. I will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites as you advance. I will not drive them out within one year. If I did, the land would become deserted, and the wild animals would be too many for you. Instead, I will drive them out little by little until there are enough of you to take possession of the land. I will make the borders of your land extend from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. Wow. And, that, and that's what David and Solomon had, basically. Yep. I will give you power over the inhabitants of the land, and you will drive them out as you would, and I will and you will drive them out as you advance. Okay, right. now let me just, I know you got a few words still to go there, but okay, if David and or Solomon is ruling that whole territory there, what's happened to those nations? They're destroyed, right? They no longer exist as independent nations. They're now a part of the Israelite nation, right? But they're gonna come back. Yes, well, Philistines did come back. Well, the Philistines are out in another, that was on another side. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Verse 32, do not make any agreement with them or with their gods. Do not let these people live in your country. If you do, they will make you sin against me. If you worship their gods, it will be a fatal trap for you. And now, that phrase, a fatal trap for you, is repeated multiple times. Yeah. Okay, now let me ask you a question. If God gave them these instructions, if here you are, and even if you're a, the military leader of this group, and God promises to do everything for you, why wouldn't you want him to do it? Well, unfortunately, if you read through the final things and you go down, you go back to Deuteronomy 20 and so forth, it turns out that God finally, they said, oh, we, we want to do this ourselves. We want to conquer with our sword so that we get the credit. We don't want God to get the credit. We want us to get the credit. God says, you'll be sorry. I promise to do it for you. There it is. I just spelled it out in Exodus 23. No, no, we want to do it our way. Give us a king. Yeah. Everyone else has a king. We want a king. So God's reason for wanting to take the Israelites into Canaan, his way, was to avoid any chance of their learning pagan ways and following them. One other thing that the pagan religions were known for besides child sacrifice was their fertility cult religions. What does that mean? Numbers 25, I'm going to read, read, read verses 1 to 5 and 9, and this should be a familiar story. When the Israelites were encamped in the valley of Acacia, this is on, in the plains of Moab, across the Jordan River from Jericho. They're just ready to go into the, the promised land. The men began to have sexual intercourse with the Moabite women who were there. These women invited them to sacrificial feasts where the god of Moab was worshipped. Imagine what kind of worship that was. The Israelites ate the food and worshipped the god Baal of Peor. So the Lord was angry with them and said to Moses, take all the leaders of Israel and in obedience to me, execute them in broad daylight. This is the people who are taking up this Moabite religion. And then I will no longer be angry with the people. Moses said to the officials, each of you is to kill every man in your tribe who has become a worshiper of Baal of Peor. And then I'm skipping some, some details in the verses there, but verse nine, but it had already killed 24,000 people, 24,000 people got involved apparently in worshiping Baal right there 
on the border of the promised land after the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And the Lord says before he left the earth, he says, be ye in the world, but do not be a part of it. And that's what we see right here. Uh, be in the world, be a witness, but do not be a part of it. Can you even imagine what kind of worship services those were? Is it any surprise that God called his people to be separate and distinct from those other nations? What's the other religious word for separate and distinct? Peculiar. Peculiar. Peculiar is one word. That's a more common word is holy, hmm. sanctified. Peculiar is the King James Version. Yeah. But it means holy, even the word holy means to be separate. So, but keep in mind that Ruth, the Moabite, was a descendant of these people who were horrible, and she became a, an ancestor of, of David and an ancestor of Jesus. Well, you can go back a little before that. And what about Rahab? Yeah. <laughs> she was a Canaanite from Jericho. Yeah. Jim, Deuteronomy. Uh, verses 16 to 19. Today the Lord your God commands you to obey all his laws. So obey them faithfully with all your heart. Today you have acknowledged the Lord as your God. You have promised to obey him, to keep all his laws and do all that he commands. Now I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Why is he talking about today, today, today? This is a sermon. It's recorded. Moses is standing up there and saying, please, today, you know, do it today. Okay, go ahead. Uh, verse 18, today the Lord has accepted you as his own people, as he promised you and commands you to obey all his laws. He will make you greater than any other nation that he has created, and you will bring praise and honor to his name. You will be his own people as he promised. Good news, Bible. Okay. As Moses was finishing his sermons to the Israelites, they were camped across the Jordan River, which was flooded in the springtime, from Jericho. Moses was determined to make it as urgent as possible that Israel maintain a right relationship with God. I mean, here they are, they're on the doorstep of the Promised Land. They've been working for 40 years to get there. And so many people have died in the process of trying to get there. Well, given all we know about them, would you call them the faithful people of God? Would God claim us as his faithful people today? While our study of the history of the children of Israel might lead us to think that they were pretty wicked, we have seen that in contrast to the other nations around them, they probably looked pretty good. <laughs> And the other nations recognized that their God was very remarkable. And it, it's hard for us to know, but there are some hints right through the story of the wandering in the wilderness that they had occasional interaction with other nations around them. And these people learned about them. They learned, they, you know, just think of, suppose you were a young person and you're wandering, you belong to one of those tribes that was out there wandering nomads out there and oh here come the children of Israel well you would go over there and see what's going on and then you look up and what's happening cloud there's a cloud in the middle of the day in the middle and then at night time it turns into a pillar of fire and you say what is that and then he would go back and tell you know those children those people they had their God and you can see him right up there now they couldn't see him as something they could make an idol out of but there he is leading them. Compared to the other nations, the children of Israel had present truth. And what about us? After Jesus came and showed us how to live and how to relate to God, then he said, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. There should not be any questions left. We have noticed the fact that Deuteronomy is organized in a pattern that was consistent with covenant agreements common in the days of Abraham and Moses. So we've already talked about that strange thing that Abraham did to seal that covenant with God, and now we find out that the whole book of Deuteronomy is organized in a way similar to the way legal documents were, were done in, in, in those days. 
But the relationship God wants to have with us is much deeper and broader than just a legal agreement. God wants to treat us as his children, even as his friends, John 15, 15. Can we be sure that God has chosen us as children or, or, or are we his friends? Think of how Jesus related to his disciples while he was on this earth. He treated them as brothers. So what's the relationship between obedience to God's law and a loving relationship with him? Remember that Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, John 14, 15. To know him is to love him. And then an incredible statement from Ellen White. Carrie? All right. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was hard work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall but we shall be rather but carrying out for our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. Amen. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Now, can I interrupt there for a second? What is he saying? If we, when we know God as it is our privilege to know him, what will happen? Our life will be a life of continual obedience. obedience. So to know him is to love him. To know him is to obey him. Yeah. And another word, way you could say it is listen to his advice and instruction. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. And that's from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 3. Wow. Would that all of us would find sin hateful. How would that impact us if we literally found sin to be hateful? Well, notice also this comment by Ellen White. Charles? The spirit of bondage is endangered by seeking to live in accordance with the legal religion through striving to fulfill the claims of the law on our own strength. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel is preached to Abraham, through which he had hope, was the same gospel that is preached to us today, through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and the finisher of our faith. Ellen White, Youth Instructor, September 22, 1892. Okay, wow. Yeah, wow. These are the themes we have seen in this lesson. See if we can sort of identify them and think about them. Gordon? Number one, the God of life. The Lord established his covenant with Israel, not because of them and who they were, but because of himself and who he is, the God of life. Now, I have, always have a question when they, and I don't argue, but that's true, but I, I always raise this extra point. Well, if it's all about God, why can't he do that for everybody? And maybe he does. Free to make choices. Yeah. God can't do something, can't change your mind. All he can do is educate you. If you don't want to listen, you suffer the consequences. Not at the hands of God, but that's the way sin works. He does not force us to yeah. love him. Contrary to his character. Yeah. Number two, so number one was the God of life. Number two, the chosen people. Because of God's faithfulness to the fathers, he was he has chosen Israel to be his covenant people. Three, a holy people. Called by the God of life to be the covenant people, they are to be a holy people as well. That's from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 39. Okay, now I said holy means what? Set apart. Set apart, Set apart. separate, distinct. God seems to have suggested again and again that, that his covenant involves today, right now, every minute. 
God recognized that in order to live according to his plan for our lives, it must become a habit. God's covenant with the human race is an indication of who he is and what he is like, not an indication of anything about us. Nothing we could ever do would make us worthy of what God has done for us. In Deuteronomy, there are many warnings against various aspects of idolatry. So what is so bad about idolatry? Well, idolatry is the very mechanism whereby God's people w would move away from God and thereby away from life. Moses described idolatry as a process that originates in ourselves. For the worship of idols is the worship of what we do, of who we are. This is why Moses counsels, take careful heed to yourselves, Deuteronomy 4.15. This is why the first co commandment that is derived from the affirmation of God's act of salvation is derived from the affirmation of God's act of salvation, Deuteronomy 5, verse 6, is the commandment that enjoins monotheism. What do we mean by monotheism? One God. There is no other God except me, right? Which is followed by the commandment that forbids idolatry, Deuteronomy 5, 8. This also is why in the, why in the same context the commandment to keep the Sabbath is justified by God's act of salvation, Deuteronomy 5.15. And why the repetition of the Ten Commandments is followed by the call to love God, in Deuteronomy 6, which implies the same exclusive relationship. That's from our adult teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 40. So now let's think about this for a minute. God repeats the Ten Commandments and then Immediately in Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9, what does he talk about? We need to love God with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds, with all our might. Okay? Does that have something to do with the Ten Commandments? It sure does. And when Satan came to Jesus to tempt him, he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6. Yep. God tried to make a clear case in Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 to 40, for why the children of Israel should faithfully obey him and not get distracted to any of those other religions. And we, if we had time, we would look through it. He reminded the people of their experience with him at the foot of Mount Sinai. No other nation had ever had such an experience. He warned them against worshiping sun, moon, or stars, as well as animals, birds, or reptiles which other nations were already worshiping. He also reminded them that even though they heard him and they felt the effects of his being on the mountain, they never saw him. There was no way they could make an idol representing him because they had never seen him. And then starting with Deuteronomy 4, 27 to 29, he talked about some of the evil things that would happen to them if they disobeyed God and began worshiping like those other nations. I mean, it's spelled out, bam, 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 bam. Like I said, if we could read the first seven chapters of Deuteronomy. But after giving that long dissertation, Moses turned to Deuteronomy 6 and said, we must learn to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our strength. And he suggested some ways to remind us of that fact. Was it really necessary for God to choose one particular people, in this case the children of Israel, to be his receptacle for the transmission of the truth about universal salvation? Why did God seem to work only with them for hundreds of years? I mean, what about maybe the people in Japan or the people in China? Is that fair? God tried to work with several other nations. Mm -hmm. They rejected him. If you look at the, uh, this, earth, this creation, it was to educate the heavenly intelligences that were prior to this experience that we have. And he, according to Deuteronomy 32, as I re referenced earlier, he let these other Elohim speak there. I mean, look, look at Sennacherib and all and these uh, ancient uh, Marduk and all these uh, pagan religions. Let them show and teach them how what the result of not listening to the Creator. What what the if result? You, if you worship all those other phony gods, look what happens. Yep. Well, 
I mean, he could take, God could write it out. He'd write out the Ten Commandments. He could write it, give instructions. He could have the seminars. But if they don't experience it, mm -hmm. <laughs> remember that the word holy or sanctified means to be set apart, to be different from those around. Try to imagine yourself camped with the children of Israel on the plains of Moab, across the flooded Jordan River from the city of Jericho, and God, and they're looking over there, okay, that's the land that God has promised to us. And God speaking to Moses, who had been your leader for 40 years, giving you these messages. How do you think you would have responded? Can we inherently sinful people really develop a close working relationship with our holy God? Would our lives be obviously different? Is that why Jesus said what is recorded in Matthew 5, 16? Carrie? In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. What does it really mean to be separate? To be holy, what would you do if you found yourself in the following situations? And we don't have time to look at all these, but here's an example. What would, what would you do if you were invited to a friend's house? Your friend, who is not an Adventist, serves you a meal with pork that she has prepared. How can you be human, that is, loving and respectful of her hospitality, and yet be holy, separate, as in not transgressing God's prohibition against unclean food? And there are other kinds of examples. You're in the church, and behind you a group of young, young youth are laughing and talking. How would you teach them to be reverent and to respect the sacred character of the sanctuary, being holy, in a way that still inspires a positive relationship for them? Think about that. Has that ever happened to any of you? How can you explain the truth of prophecy to a group of non-believers that still be clear, interesting, and relevant to them? You're a leader in a church that is divided into two groups. One group likes to emphasize social justice, brotherly love, and the importance of grace, while the other group emphasizes judgment and the law. How do you propose to manage the tension between the two groups? And this, I mean, there's enough arguments just over what kind of music we're gonna, we're gonna have in church. Think about it. Is this loving our neighbors? Are we getting along? Are we, are we representing God to the entire universe? Are we ready to live the kind of lives God is asking us to live? Are we ready to represent Him so that those around us can recognize Him in us? Think about it. Our kind and wonderful Father, these words of wisdom given by Moses, given by you through Moses to the children of Israel still seems so relevant to us in our day. How well are we doing? Are we following your advice? Could we do better? And what will we need to do to reach that place where the gospel has been spread to the whole world and you can come back? May it be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.